Perspective switch. Billy Cox, infantryman. A shadow spread across the UCLA campus. Craning his neck, Junior said, Will you look at the size of that mother? He had been saying that for the last five minutes as the starship slowly descended. Each time, Billy Cox could only nod, his mouth dry, his hands clutching the plastic grip and cool metal barrel of his rifle. The Neo-Armalite seemed totally impotent against the huge bulk floating so arrogantly downward. The alien flying machines around it were as minnows beside a whale, while they in turn dwarfed the USAF planes circling at a greater distance. The roar of their jets assailed the ears of the nervous troops and civilians on the ground. The aliens' engines were eerily silent. The starship landed in the open quad between New Royce, New Haines, New Kinsey, and New Powell Halls. It towered higher than any of the two-story red brick buildings, each a reconstruction of one overthrown in the earthquake of 2034. Cox heard saplings splinter under the weight of the alien craft. He wondered what it would have done to the big trees that had fallen five years ago, along with the famous old halls. All right, they've landed. Let's move on up, Lieutenant Shotton ordered. He could not quite keep the wobble out of his voice, but he trotted south toward the starship. His platoon followed him past Dixon Art Center, past New Bunch Hall. Not so long ago, Billy Cox had walked this campus barefoot. Now his boots thudded on concrete. The platoon deployed in front of Dodd Hall, looking west toward the spacecraft. A little breeze toyed with the leaves of the young, hopeful trees planted to replace the stalwarts lost to the quake. Take as much cover as you can, Lieutenant Shotton ordered quietly. The platoon scrambled into flower beds, snuggled down behind thin tree trunks. Out on Hillgard Avenue, diesels roared as armored fighting vehicles took positions with good lines of fire. It was all such a waste. Cox thought bitterly. The thing to do was to make friends with the aliens, not to assume automatically they were dangerous. Something, at least, was being done along those lines. A delegation came out of Murphy Hall and slowly walked behind a white flag from the administration building toward the starship. At the head of the delegation was the mayor of Los Angeles. The president and governor were busy elsewhere. Billy Cox would have given anything to be part of the delegation instead of sprawled here on his belly in the grass. If only the aliens had waited until he was 50 or so, had given him a chance to get established. Sergeant Amaros nudged him with an elbow. Look there, man. Something's happening. Amaros was right. Several hatchways which had been shut were swinging open, allowing Earth's air to mingle with the ships. The westerly breeze picked up. Cox's nose twitched. He could not name all the exotic odors wafting his way, but he recognized sewage and garbage when he smelled them. God, what a stink, he said. Perspective switch, Captain Togram, Roxolana fleet. By the gods, what a stink, Togram exclaimed. When the outer airlock doors went down, he had expected real fresh air to replace the stale, overused gases inside the Indomitable. This stuff smelled like smoky peat fires or lamps whose wicks hadn't quite been extinguished, and it stung. He felt the nictitating membranes flick across his eyes to protect them. Deploy, he ordered, leading his company forward. This was the tricky part. If the locals had enough nerve, they could hit the Roxolani just as the latter were coming out of their ship and cause all sorts of trouble. Most races without hyperdrive, though, were too overawed by the arrival of travelers from the stars to try anything like that. And if they didn't do it fast, it would be too late. They weren't doing it here. Togram saw a few locals, but they were keeping a respectful distance. He wasn't sure how many there were. Their mottled skins, or was that clothing, made them hard to notice and count. But they were plainly warriors, both by the way they acted and by the weapons they bore. His own company went into its familiar two-line formation, the first crouching, the second standing and aiming their muskets over the heads of the troops in front. Ah. There we go, Togram said happily. The bunch approaching behind the white banner had to be the local nobles. The modeling, the captain saw, was clothing, for these beings wore entirely different garments, somber except for strange, narrow neckcloths. They were taller and skinnier than Roxolani, with muzzleless faces. In lingua, Togram called. The veteran trooper led the right flank squad of the company. Sir, your troops quarter right face. At the command, pick off the leaders there. 
That will demoralize the rest, Togrum said, quoting standard doctrine. Slow match is ready, Togrum said. The Roxolani lowered the smoldering cords to the touchholes of their muskets. Take your aim, the guns moved very slightly. Fire, perspective switch, Billy Cox, infantryman. Teddy bears, Sandy Amaros exclaimed. The same thought had leaped into Cox's mind. The beings emerging from the spaceship were round, brown, and furry, with long noses and big ears. Teddy bears, however, did not normally carry weapons. They also, Cox thought, did not commonly live in a place that smelled like sewage. Of course, it might have been a perfume to them. But if it was, they and Earth people were going to have trouble getting along. He watched the teddy bears as they took their positions. Somehow their positioning did not suggest that they were forming an honor guard for the mayor and his party. Yet it did look familiar to Cox, although he could not quite figure out why. Then he had it. If he had been anywhere but at UCLA, he would not have made the connection. But he remembered a course he had taken on the rise of the European nation-states in the 16th century and on the importance of the professional, disciplined armies the kings had created. Those early armies had performed evolutions like this one. It was a funny coincidence. He was about to mention it to his sergeant when the world blew up. Flames spurted from the aliens' guns. Great gouts of smoke puffed into the sky. Something that sounded like an angry wasp buzzed past Cox's ear. He heard shouts and shrieks from either side. Most of the mayor's delegation was down, some motionless, others thrashing. There was a crash from the starship, and another one an instant later, as a round shot smashed into the brickwork of Dodd Hall. A chip stung Cox in the back of the neck. The breeze brought him the smell of fireworks, one he had not smelled for years. Perspective switch, Captain Togram, Roxolana fleet. Reload, Togram yelled. Another volley, then Adam with the bayonet. His troopers worked frantically, measuring powder charges and ramming round bullets home. Perspective switch. Billy Cox, infantryman. So that's how they want to play. Amaros shouted. Nail their hides to the wall. The tip of his little finger had been shot away. He did not seem to know it. Cox's neo-armalite was already barking, spitting a stream of hot brass cartridges, slamming against his shoulder. He rammed in clip after clip, playing the rifle like a hose. If one bullet didn't bite, the next would. Others from the platoon were also firing. Cox heard bursts of automatic weapons fire from different parts of the campus, too, and the deeper blasts of rocket-propelled grenades and field artillery. Smoke not of the aliens' making began to envelop their ship and the soldiers around it. One or two shots came back at the platoon, and then a few more, but so few that Cox, in stunned disbelief, shouted to his sergeant, This isn't fair! Fuck em! Amaro shouted back. They want to throw their weight around. They take their chances. Only good thing they did was knock over the mayor. Always did hate that old crackpot. Perspective switch. Captain Togram. Roxolana fleet. The harsh tack-tack-tack did not sound like any gunfire Togram had heard. The shots came too close together, making a horrible sheet of noise. And if the locals were shooting back at his troopers, where were the thick, choking clouds of gunpowder smoke over their position? He did not know the answer to that. What he did know was that his company was going down like grain before a scythe. Here a soldier was hit by three bullets at once and fell awkwardly, as if his body could not tell in which direction to twist. There another had the top of his head gruesomely removed. The volley the captain had screamed for was still born. Perhaps a squad's worth of soldiers moved toward the locals, the sun glinting bravely off their long, polished bayonets. None of them got more than a half sixteen paces before falling. Ilingua looked at Togram, horror in his eyes, his ears flat against his head. The captain knew he was the same. What are they doing to us? Ilingua howled. Togram could only shake his head helplessly. He dove behind a corpse, fired one of his pistols at the enemy. There was still a chance, he thought. How would these demonic aliens stand up under their first air attack? A flyer swooped toward the locals. Musketeers blasted away from firing ports, drew back to reload. Take that, you horsons, Togram shouted. He did not, however, raise his fist in the air. That, he had already learned, was dangerous. Perspective switch. Billy Cox, infantryman. Incoming aircraft, Sergeant Amaros roared. His squad, those not already prone, flung themselves on their faces. 
Cox heard shouts of pain through the combat din as men were wounded. The Cottonmouth crew launched their shoulder-fired AA missile at the alien flying machine. The pilot must have had reflexes like a cat's. He sidestepped his machine in midair. No plane built on Earth could have matched that performance. The Cottonmouth shot harmlessly past. The flyer dropped what looked like a load of crockery. The ground jumped as the bombs exploded. Cursing, deafened, Billy Cox stopped worrying whether the fight was fair, but the flyer pilot had not seen the F-29 fighter on his tail. The USAF plane released two missiles from point-blank range, less than a mile. The infrared seeker found no target and blew itself up, but the missile that homed on radar streaked straight toward the flyer. The explosion made Cox bury his face in the ground and clap his hands over his ears. So this is war, he thought. I can't see, I can barely hear, and my side is winning. What must it be like for the losers? Perspective switch, Captain Togram. Hope died in Togram's heart when the first flyer fell victim to the local's aircraft. The rest of the Indomitable's machines did not last much longer. They could evade, but had even less ability to hit back than the Roxolana ground forces. And they were hideously vulnerable when attacked in their pilot's blind spots from below or behind. One of the starship's cannon managed to fire again and quickly drew a response from the traveling fortresses. Togram got glimpses of as they took their positions in the streets outside this park-like area. When the first shell struck, the luckless captain thought for an instant that it was another gun going off aboard the Indomitable. The sound of the explosion was nothing like the crash a solid shot made when it smacked into a target. A fragment of hot metal buried itself in the ground by Togram's hand. That made him think a cannon had blown up, but more explosions on the ship's superstructure and fountains of dirt flying up from misses showed it was just more from the locals' fiendish arsenal. Something large and hard struck the captain in the back of the neck. The world spiraled down into blackness. Perspective switch, Billy Cox, infantryman. Cease fire. The order reached the field artillery first, then the infantry units at the very front line. Billy Cox pushed up his cuff to look at his watch, stared in disbelief. The whole firefight had lasted less than 20 minutes. He looked around. Lieutenant Shotton was getting up from behind an ornamental palm. Let's see what we have, he said. His rifle still at the ready, he began to walk slowly toward the starship. It was hardly more than a smoking ruin. For that matter, neither were the buildings around it. The damage to their predecessors had been worse in the big quake, but not much. Alien corpses littered the lawn. The blood splashing the bright green grass was crimson as any man's. Cox bent to pick up a pistol. The weapon was beautifully made, with scenes of combat carved into the grayish wood of the stock. But he recognized it as a single-shot piece, a small arm obsolete for at least two centuries. He shook his head in wonderment. Sergeant Amaros lifted a conical object from where it had fallen beside a dead alien. What the hell is this? he demanded. Again, Cox had the feeling of being caught up in something he did not understand. It's a powder horn, he said. Like in the movies? Pioneers and all that good shit? The very same. Damn, Amaro said feelingly. Cox nodded in agreement. Along with the rest of the platoon, they moved closer to the wrecked ship. Most of the aliens had died still in the two neat rows from which they had opened fire on the soldiers. Here, behind another corpse, lay the body of the scarlet-plumed officer who had given the order to begin that horrifyingly uneven encounter. Then, startling Cox, the alien moaned and stirred, just as might a human starting to come to. Grab him, he's a live one, Cox exclaimed. Several men jumped on the reviving alien, who was too groggy to fight back. Soldiers began peering into the holes torn in the starship, and even going inside. There they were still wary. The ship was so incredibly much bigger than any human spacecraft that there were surely survivors despite the shellacking it had taken. As always happens, the men did not get to enjoy such pleasures for long. The fighting had been over for only minutes when the first team of experts came stuttering in by helicopter, saw common soldiers in their private preserve, and made horrified noises. The experts also promptly relieved the platoon of its prisoners. Sergeant Amaros watched resentfully as they took the alien away. You must have known it would happen, Sandy, Cox consoled him. We do the dirty work, and the brass takes over once things get cleaned up again. 
Yeah, but wouldn't it be wonderful if just once it was the other way round? Amoros laughed without humor. You don't need to tell me. Fat friggin' chance. This is the end of part three of The Road Not Taken by Harry Turtledove. If you want to see part four, make sure to like and subscribe. It will be coming out shortly.